very pleased, excited here to have you all. Thank you for coming. We are here to celebrate the International Day of the Arabic Language. And on behalf of the Center of Islamic Studies at SOAS and the Saudi Cultural Bureau in London, I welcome you all to this very pleasant experience, we hope, of celebrating the great language of Arabic. I am Muhammad Abdul Halim, Professor Abdul Halim. I am the director of the Center of Islamic Studies. Okay, my subject, as you might have heard, is called Arabic Language and Sciences. On the 18th of December 1973, Arabic was designated the sixth official language of the United Nations. And on the same day, it was the day was dedicated as the United Nations Arabic Language Day. Okay? So the subject for this year is Arabic language and science. This is all very well. Hello. This is all very well. It's coming late in time, but it's all very important. Yes. As you may know, Arabic now is a major language of the world. It's spoken by no less than four, no more than 400 million in the Arab countries. And we have some even here in Russell School who speak Arabic. And also, it is the language, the religious language of the Muslim the world, which uh, about at least six of the world population spread all over the world. Arabic is a remarkable language which has survived for millennia. millennia. I will be speaking Arabic about the standard Arabic known as Fusha. For a long time, this had, it was a literary language with highly developed poetry and prose. The most significant event in the entire history of the Arabic language was the revelation of the Quran in Arabic from between the years 610 and 632. This was destined to immortalize the Arabic language. Without the Quran, it could have dwindled in the middle of the desert, as many has done. Now, it also, <coughs> Arabic, the Quran fixed the syntax of Arabic. The syntax of the Arabic language, since the time of the Quran, has remained the same. Okay? The Quran also spread the language outside Arabia, which is where it was, now in the countries of the Middle East, but as a language of Islam, they are spread all over the world amongst Muslims. This is the religious language. The Quran also gave rise to the Arabic linguistic sciences. Grammar was developed to help converts from other cultures to, pronounce, to, to read the Quran correctly. Arabic phonetics was developed to make people and the articulate of Quran well, Arabic rhetoric was developed in order to identify and describe the stylistic features that makes the Quran inimitable, inimitable as the Arabs and the Muslims saw it. Okay, now, <clears throat> uh, the language, you see, because of the connection with, with the Quran, because of the connection with the Quran, it really made the Arabic, made Arabic a controlled language. From early on, Arab linguists, Arab, Arab linguists have decided on where the pure language will be taken. Time and in location, middle of Arabia, and for a certain time after which it will be, as it will be mixed by so many other people from different cultures, any something that comes after that, unless it is on the pattern that has been established in the Quran, would not be considered a fusha or real pure Arabic. <coughs> okay, so that was controlled by the Quran and linguists at the time. In modern times, from the 1930s onward, we had in the Arab world, language academies, like the one in Cairo, which was established to regulate and develop the Arabic language. Mm -hmm. Now, 
Another important point is the Quran urged Muslims to look into the horizons and everywhere around them to reflect on God's creation. Look around and reflect. Mm -hmm. Actually, the Quran emphasizes it is only the learned people that stand in awe of God. In that context, it really means those who observe, reflect, and discover. That is in the verse in uh, chapter, chapter 30, 35, verse 28. So only those who can reflect and discover, these are the ones considered who will be in awe of God. For this reason, we find that Arab scientists and philosophers, but Arabs also Muslims who became Arabized in their language, you see, all the Arab scientists and philosophers started their life, their education, learning the Quran by heart. Okay, and the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad sallam, is reported to have said, seek knowledge even unto China. This is important. And he said, Wisdom is the lost property of a believer. Wherever he finds it, he has the first right to it. He has the first right to it. So it was these teachings that directed Muslims to seek knowledge from civilizations other than their own around them, like Greek, Syriac, Persian, uh, Indian, and Chinese, and to translate the work from these languages into Arabic. Translation became very important during the time of al mamun Caliph al mamun who died in 933. He, he established something called the House of Wisdom and used to pay very well for translators. It is reported that he, with some translators, he would give them the weight of their book in gold. In gold. And in those days, paper was very heavy and thick, so they did very well. Nowadays, we translators have become very cheap. <laughs> so, Islam, Islam then, is not an isolationist or a rejectionist religion. It is not. It is not. Muslim philosophers speak of Aristotle as the first master. The first master. And you find very great Christian Syriac families uh, called Bakht Yashur, who were brought very close to the caliph, number of Abbasid caliph, and the great Jewish philosopher and physician, the Maimonides of Andalusia, served Salah al-Din Saladin in Egypt. So, now, we should remember that Arabic was a literary language, you see. Some of the characteristics of literary language is you have emotional, you have figures of speech, you have synonyms, and so on. This does not work for science language. So, first thing, first requirement was to develop a set of technical terms for translating these works from other cultures. You see, precision was required. And this became a very important science in Islam and in Arabic. We have large numbers of technical terms throughout the Islamic Arabic period. Okay. Um, you see this? Mustalahat, as they call them, in all subjects. And they will have to look at the time. Okay. So Arabic had to face, had to face the requirements of developments and discoveries, scientific discoveries, from the centers of learning in the past and now from the most advanced centers in the world. The most advanced centers and discoveries in the world. Arabic had to face this, absorb it in obedience to the tradition and what the Prophet said, and remain Arabic at the same time, because this is the language of the Quran. This was a challenge. It was a very tall order, but they did it. 
was it was done in the past and in the present time. Arabic was helped, helped by the nature of the language itself. Ingenious morphology, self in Arabic. Great. This was very helpful and uh, also the broad-mindedness of Arab and Muslim scholars. I would urge you to even leave your job and come and study Arabic morphology and so on. You will never regret it. Okay, Arabic developed tools for getting new vocabulary, new scientific vocabulary, how to develop, expand the language. It had tools to do this. I can mention six of them here. <coughs> First one is derivation. You have a word like kataba, which means to write, and from this you get vast numbers of words. Writer, something written, your letter, your desk, your urat to write, and so is library, water stone bookshop, and many, many other words derived from the same book. This is a great vacuum of Arabic morphology, which relies mainly on derivation, as English and some other European languages rely on affixation at the beginning and at the end of the word. So, derivation. Number two, analogy. Yes, in Arabic. Building, coining new words by analogy with others. Yesterday, the last I heard of this yesterday, is da'ashana. To da'ashanaize someone or some people. Take the noun, take the noun, turn it into a verb, and transitive verb, on a pattern which is particular to this. So the Arabs are very clever the Arabic language, especially with words that are unacceptable, like the Asherites and so on. That is, but the analogy increases, enriches the language. Then there is fusion. It's called Nahd in Arabic. You see, Basmala, for Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, the long statement, is Basmala. It's used in modern Arabic now, in science. So, amphibious, it's called Parramahi. It helps the language to fuse words together. Mm -hmm. Then you have borrowing from other languages. A lot of words were borrowed from Persian and Greek and so on in the past, and now you, have, you borrow from English. I have seen Zoom, and I have seen Google, and so on. <coughs> the, uh, but what was borrowing, uh, I think English is more, is more, uh, and, uh, more uh, flexible than Arabic in this. Then you have invention of words. So in English, you have you sandwich because the block, one block ate a lot of that stuff, so they <laughs> named them sandwich. Uh, if any of you eats all the food that's coming this evening, Arabic will not name him or her after that food. <laughs> yes. Then Arabization is called ta'rib. So invention, you see, like uh, uh, sandwich, and Macintosh, and so on. Ta'rib, try to tweak the words to make them like Arabic in sound and in food. Okay. The Arab, you see, after having the, the Arab, having this developed, having the translation, and developing the, the technology, the terminology, began their own rich heritage of Arabic sciences. Rich heritage of Arabic sciences in all subjects. You have med medicine, you have biology, you have chemistry, etc., etc. There is a long list of them here. Yes. They were ahead of anybody at that time. They were ahead of the West, for sure. And we find in the West, people try to get information or knowledge from the Arabic. The Robert of Keton, who translated the Quran into Latin in 1130, 43, I think, went to Spain to learn Arabic sciences. And you will find the chair of Arabic in Cambridge in 1632 was established and the Founder gave some uh, any, uh, objectives for that. One of them was to get the land which is still looked up in that learned tongue about Arabic. To get the learning from uh, still looked up in that tongue. And that, by the way, a 
Another objective was to help the Kengan state by the Kengan state by trade. And a third one, wait for this, was to enlarge the border of Christianity and propagate Christianity among those among them who still live in darkness. These people lived in hope in those days. Our professor of Arabic here at Sawas doesn't have anything like this in his job description. <laughs> Okay, now, uh, so among the most, you see, we have among the most, this is a statement by Alman uh, writing about the uh, Arabic medicine, among the most creative geniuses of the medieval times was Abyssinia, uh, Ibn Sina. You see, his book, it's called the Al-Qanun, the Canon, was translated 36 times in the 15th and 16th centuries, and was the book in Europe. The Abyssinian or Abyssinianism was the, yani the all the medicine in Europe or the medical centers relied on that, as this man is saying. And you had in order to be a good physician, you had to be a good Abyssinianist. Okay. Mm -hmm. It has been established that um, hundreds of terms went into European language from Arabic. I have a long list here, I can just give you one. Word, if I may, I will give you alcohol, which was introduced by Arabic, and the people here lapped it simply because they love the stuff. <laughs> Some excessively judging by the number of alcoholics around the country. Now, uh, on the shoulder of these Arabic sciences, the European Renaissance started, and naturally, built on that, you have the Enlightenment. And you have the uh, Industrial Revolution and the Great Sand Learning Revolution, Scientific and Technological Revolution in the West to an unprecedented level before. So while the West woke up, the roles were reversed. The West woke up, the Arabs went fast asleep and were shocked into reality by the advancing armies, colonial armies, equipped with science and technology. Now, they quickly started to build up their education again in Egypt, for instance, and in many other countries. I'm talking about Arab countries, so Egypt is an example. They started their education. Incidentally, some people then started to cast doubts on the ability of the Arabic to catch up with the modern times. There was a British advisor to the Ministry of Education in Egypt, who was Scottish. And he said to them, if you want to develop, you will have to give up Arabic and have your education in English. They said to him, this is all haggis. We will have none of this because they want to keep the connection with the Quran. Incidentally, haggis happened to sound like the Egyptian word haggis, which is nonsense. <laughs> yes. Um, so the, rather than take another language, the Arabs began to translate again from other languages, and they developed language academies, like the one in Cairo, um, which is more active, I suppose, than the other. I have a list of four of them now, and plus a center started by the UNESCO, ISISCO, ISISCO which is the Arabic UNESCO to and he coordinate the terminology among these centers. Okay, um, I haven't got much time, I've got many information here. I would say that Arabic has, as we said, lived and remained as Arabic, absorbed the language, absorbed all the foreign sciences and philosophy, and now it has absorbed all the scientific and technical terms of the Western languages. They are all in Arabic. Now, we have the, course, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Language Academy in Cairo produced vast numbers of dictionaries. This is one of the latest dictionary of computer terms. I looked up spam because I had a lot of it. So it found, I found that it translated as umama. Rubbish or trash, and I looked up a uh, chip, wrote a little chip, and 
and it says Rokaka. A nice word. Say after me. Rokaka. Rokaka. <laughs> now you know, have learned some Arabic in the Arabic language today. But you must always remember that it so happened that in Egypt, Rokaka also means filo pastry. So you can eat your chip with fish if you like. The Arabic language, it is not the fault. See, Arabs don't produce much science now. This is not the fault of the Arabic language. Just as there are many countries that speak English and they don't produce anything. It is great that the Arabic language, the Arabic language is the head of Arab scientists. It has encompassed everything in Arabic while remaining Arabic with a glorious past and a bright future. Thank you. task to introduce these learned men. We put the best for you, nothing but the best. I now have the great pleasure of introducing my learned friend, Dr. Nasser bin Ghali from the Saudi Arabian Cultural Center. He will speak about Arabic as a language of science and technology. Tafadbal, I want to hear you. Arabic language day is celebrated on December 18 April. The event was established by the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, which is UNESCO, in 2010. was established to celebrate multilingualism and cultural diversity as well as to promote equal use of all six of its official working languages throughout the organization. December 18 was chosen as the date for the Arabic language, as it is the day in 1973 when the General Assembly approved Arabic as an official United Nation language. With an estimated 390 million speakers, Arabic is one of the most widely spoken languages in the world. It is also one of the six official languages of the United Nations, as well as the liturgical language of 1.6 billion Muslims. Today, there are three different levels of Arabic, classical Arabic, modern standard Arabic, which is used in publishing, education, and media across the Arab world. Colloquial Arabic and everyday dialect is also used in different regions and has numerous variations. The Arabic group in UNESCO used to celebrate this day under different title or titles of year. It was decided by them that Arabic as a language of science and technology 
to be the title of the celebration <coughs> of this year. I'm not going to uh, talk about this subject simply because I have no time, uh, but I will take a small issue of the subject, which is Arabic language and the localization of knowledge, and try to just to shade a light on it. For knowledge to be localized well, uh, it needs to be understood well, and for that to happen, that knowledge need to formulate it and then transfer it using the national language, which is Arabic in this context. Uh, Arabic would feel and understand and use and be creative with very well. Studies and research <coughs> indicated that the absorption of science and technology doesn't occur in depth unless those sciences and technologies are taught in the national language. In all states of mainstream education, all the way through to higher education. Uh, the advancement in science, literature, arts, and religion that occur in our Arabic Islamic civilization uh, during its prosperity was carried by the Arabic language. Civilization was, wasn't to reach to uh, the stage of localizing the knowledge and then reaching the creativity and productivity stages. If it wasn't for the stage of understanding and absorption of important knowledge that interacted with the elements of the local and original culture, first comes in-depth understanding, then comes creativity and productivity. As a result, everyone's understanding of the language that is used for transfer and production. One example of those important or important sciences is medicine. It went through the states of understanding, then through the or through to creativity in the first stage the box of a Greek scientist what was transferred, sorry, were, were transferred to Arabic, and people started studying, and understanding, and explaining them for a while. Arabic allowed for the wide separate of those sciences and made it available for those who are interested. Then came the creativity and productivity stage, which, it, which introduced to us famous scientists such as Ibn Sina, Ibn Rushd, Arazi, and Ibn Jazar, and many others who worked and but became references that were until recently taught in college, in uh, a university, including European ones. Using Arabic language in medicine resulted in wide separate of the science amongst Arabs and Muslims. Societies, knowledge of Arabic participated in the wide spread of medicine to all members of the Arabic or the Arab nation and everyone who use its language. The benefit or the benefits became greater amongst all local 
uh, or it's yeah, I mean the, uh, 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 the social classes and many branch of medicine became a popular uh, knowledge that is uh, circulated between people. This is because it was available in their own language that they understood and mastered its vocabulary and terminology. The first thing that draws things that distinguish our language from other languages is that it is old and new at the same time. It coexisted Greek, Latin, and Sanskrit and was able to continue till today, helped by its flexibility and varied characteristics such as etymology and analogy and synonymy. Arabic is suitable to be language of science and technology because the uniqueness of its structure and the richness of its vocabulary, its history, culture, and civilization. It is spoken by a large number of the uh, people, uh, and one of the six official language or languages of the United Nations. What's lacking, or what is lacking, is the only the adoption of it is language of science, of technology, where sciences are taught using it in all levels of learning and translated to, to it. Politician, political institutes, and decision makers need to adapt it in international relations and size, science and technology. Thank you very much. Oh, very We make the task of chairing very easy. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. And now, I now have the, the great pleasure. I will have an open great pleasure this evening. I now have the great pleasure of introducing my colleague, Dr. S. Lucas, who is a senior lecturer in linguistics, having done Arabic and linguistics. What a fine combination, the excellent combination you can have. Arabic and, and uh, linguistics which qualified him to speak to us this evening about some uh, modern linguistic solutions and how they enlighten us with that. Okay, so thank you very much indeed. Um, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. I, I do need, I need sound, I need sound, so can we stop? So it's, um, it's a great uh, honor for me to uh, speak to you this evening in such eminent company. Um, so I'm... Uh, <coughs> as, uh, as Professor Abdul Halim said, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a linguist and I, and I work on Arabic. I studied the Arabic language here at SOAS um, for my undergraduate degree. And um, it's the best place to do it, yes. And uh, it truly is, um, from my point of view, uh, an extraordinarily rich language um, to study from a linguistic point of view. Okay, so um, seeing as the theme of this um, UNESCO um, Arabic Language Day this year is Arabic and Science, and um, seeing as I... Uh, <laughs> don't know all that much about what Arabic has contributed to science, I thought what I would do instead was tell you something about how science, in particular language sciences, have contributed to our understanding of Arabic. So, um, as we've already heard, um, it's absolutely clear that um, Arabic language and Arabic culture have historically made enormous contributions to science. Um, but 
what I think um, many of those who are interested in Arabic don't perhaps appreciate um, as much as um, they ought to is that we can make progress in understanding, we can improve our understanding of Arabic by applying um, modern scientific methods to the topic. Um, and there's no doubt whatsoever that in the past, shall we say, 100 years, we've made significant progress in understanding various aspects of the Arabic language thanks to research in linguistics. Um, now, I don't want you to misunderstand me. Um, as we've heard, um, Arab Arabic-speaking culture was way ahead of Europe in scientific matters in the European Dark Ages, and linguistics is no exception whatsoever. I don't know if you've heard of this great linguist, Sibawe. I mean, he, he stands as one of the very greatest linguists of all time to this day. Um, and he was working in the, in the 8th century uh, and produced analyses of Arabic which um, are astonishingly sophisticated even today. But even though he produced these great insights, insights I think we can still make, make progress. So um, this is what I want to... Um, I want to have a quick look at these two questions today. So we've already heard that you can distinguish at least two types of Arabic. Fosha, the, the classical language or the standard language, and Amiya, the, the, the colloquial or dialectal Arabic. And a, a very long-standing debate within Arabic is when did this differentiation between two types of Arabic occur? Did it occur before or after Islam? Okay, so that's one thing I want to look at. And the other is another um, often discussed question, the extent to which different Arabic dialects are mutually intelligible. Um, so my, my point is going to be, instead of debating such questions from our armchairs, right, and speculating, we can actually give them rather precise answers if we draw on the appropriate evidence. So, let's hope my technology works. Um, I want to give you a very quick uh, uh, sample of classical Arabic and a quick sample of dialectal Arabic, both taken from the great Lebanese singer Feirouz. Okay, let's give no. it a go. Very nice. We had her. Okay, that was a very short snatch of standard Arabic or classical Arabic. Okay, now there are, there are many very significant and very interesting differences between these two types of Arabic. And we can't possibly, unfortunately, go into all of them now. But um, one very salient difference between the two, which people often focus on, is the fact that classical Arabic has uh, cases, okay? Nouns and adjectives decline according to three cases. And verbs also have mood endings. Um, whereas in dialectal Arabic, we don't get this at all, okay? So this is one feature that we can focus in on to explore this question of when did the difference between these two um, types of Arabic occur, okay? So, here's the question. <clears throat> Was the colloquial Arabic brought to, for example, Lebanon, where Feirouz comes from, in the early Islamic era, was it identical at that time to classical Arabic or not? So, like I say, this is a huge, long-standing debate. Um, so, on the one side, um, many scholars have argued that, yes, when the, when the Arabs left the Arabian Peninsula after the coming of Islam, um, what they brought with them, what they spoke every day, was classical Arabic. And the differences we see between the dialects and, and classical Arabic are because people in, say, Lebanon, whose native language was a type of Aramaic, learned Arabic but didn't learn it very well and changed it and it thereby lost the case endings. Okay? <laughs> right, that's one, one way of looking at it. 
The other side of the debate um, says, no, even in pre-Islamic times, you had this differentiation between dialectal Arabic and high Arabic. And the Quran and pre-Islamic poetry was written in the high variety. But that doesn't mean that there wasn't also a colloquial variety, which just hasn't come down to us. And the interesting thing is, about this debate, as I said, um, it's pure speculation. It's been conducted just from the armchair, as it were. But um, we can answer questions like this um, in a non-speculative way, by looking at appropriate evidence, mm. like this. Now, it's very often claimed that um, before Islam, Arabic was an unwritten language. And this is actually completely false. Okay? It was not wide, well, I mean, um, few, let us say, few Arabic speakers were literate. That is true. But um, there were a few, okay? And they wrote Arabic predominantly in other scripts, okay? Uh, whether South Semitic scripts or Greek. Now, uh, a lot of, there are a lot of pre Islamic Arabic texts written in the Greek script. And this is very useful for the question of case endings, because Greek has uh, an ordinary alphabet that obligatorily um, includes symbols for vowels, okay? And the case endings of Arabic are vowels. So the evidence is, in fact, conclusive. Um, we know from documents written in Arabic with Greek, Greek script that come from before Islam that already before the time of Islam there were varieties that did not have cases. Okay? Um, and this is mainly due to recent work by um, an American scholar of Syrian extraction called Ahmed al Jalad. Mm. Um, so the point is there's no doubt that um, when speakers of other languages, such as Aramaic in Syria or Berber in North Africa, came to learn Arabic, they made enormous changes to the language. There's no doubt about that. But we can see here that um, even so, it's not the case that before Islam, the only type of Arabic there was was classical Arabic. Okay. Um, do I have time to move on to my um, other... We'll give you another three minutes. Okay, thank you very much. So, w what about this question of um, whether all Arabic dialects are mutually intelligible? Uh, this is another thing that's uh, hotly debated. In my experience, Arabs will usually um, tell you that it's very easy for, to understand different dialects. But as, as uh, you know, I'm still learning Arabic, you spend your whole life learning Arabic. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy language. And my experience is just because you've learned something about one dialect, it doesn't mean you're going to find the next one particularly easy. And if we really think about it, if we put it this way, are all Arabic dialects mutually, in, mutually intelligible? If we think about that question seriously, no, very few people, I hope, would disagree that the answer is no. Not all Arabic dialects are mutually intelligible. So it's easy to find extreme cases. Here we go. Native speakers of Arabic, can you understand this Arabic dialect? <laughs> Now, now, it's very often said that um, um, the purest Arabic comes from Saudi Arabia. Where do you think this man is from? <laughs> yes, Jebel Faifa in Saudi Arabia. Okay, so it's easy to find some dialects that are very, very extreme and, and hard to understand. Equally, it's easy to, to find pairs of dialects where mutual comprehension is near total. For example, something like Lebanon and Syria. But then we could ask the question, are these really different dialects? Um, but the point is there's a huge grey area in between these two extremes. Um, and instead of just subjectively um, giving our impressions about these issues, we can test the question scientifically. 
So, for example, <clears throat> uh, a um, Slovak scholar called Slavomir Chepler and his colleagues have made a start on answering this question. So they tested the mutual intelligibility of Benghazi Arabic, Tunis Arabic, and Maltese, which you may or may not know is historically a variety of Arabic. Um, so they made recordings of native speakers of each, and um, they, list, they recorded these native speakers um, saying how everyday vocabulary items were said in their um, dialect, and also recorded them reading a set of simple sentences. And then 24 native speakers of each of the other two dialects were tested on the, the dialect that wasn't their native one. So what? So this gives, shows you some of the kinds of words that were tested, colors, basic adjectives, uh, eating and drinking. And the task here with the vocabulary items was they simply had to say what kind of uh, category does this word fall into? Is it a type of animal? Is it to do with uh, time and date, etc.? Uh, and with the sentences, they had to write what they heard in their own in their own variety. So, what did we? What did they find? Well, perhaps not surprisingly, Maltese people are not very good at understanding Tunisian and Libyan. Less than forty percent co correctly understood words. But look at this. With the vocabulary, everyday vocabulary, Tunisians, uh, Libyans don't even get to 80% comprehension mm. of Tunisian. And um, Tunisians um, uh, trying, to, trying to understand Libyan, only around about 80%. And with sentences, it's, it's even less, okay? Um, so this gives you some impression. It's only a start. Tunisian and Libyan, but we're looking at something like two-thirds comprehension, okay? And this kind of um, methodology can be continued with um, other pairs of dialects. Okay, so I'm, I'm sorry for going too long. This is, I'm finishing now. Um, what I want to say in summary is that we know a lot about Arabic, but there's still more to know, okay? And um, I think the way to find out more about the Arabic language is to use knowledge of linguistics, other languages, other scripts, and innovative empirical techniques. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Well. You are in an enviable position being an Arabist and a linguist. But you should have stopped without telling us more and making us lose more hope. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. I now have again the great pleasure of introducing my colleague, the professor of Arabic. Where has he gone? Yes. That is uh, Stefan Spur, professor of Arabic, and now the head of the department of the Near and Middle East, another very great Arabist. And he will speak to you. Oh, <laughs> Arabic okay, thank you very much. It's a subject to talk about. Well, uh, good evening. Um, I'm very pleased to be here uh, to speak about this very remarkable subject, which you see illustrated here, a Quran manuscript from the 15th century. Have a look at it quietly for a moment. What you see is a script which is generally described as remarkably beautiful. There is clearly a certain stately regularity there, but there is also immense fluidity, rhythm, agility, pliancy. The question I'd like to discuss very briefly with you is where does all this come from? And I'd like to show you that it has, in fact, a lot to do with science. Of course, today we're talking about Arabic and science. Well, uh, let's go into the past. Where did it all begin? And we can go quite a long way into the past, to 1800 BC, to this particular little animal. This is a sphinx from the Sinai Peninsula. And on this Egyptian Sphinx, an inscription was discovered which looks like this. And what you see here is the earliest beginning of the alphabet. Wow. Out of these alphabetic signs, which are derived from the hieroglyphs, uh, emerged what is today Greek and Latin and Arabic and Hebrew and Cyrillic.
And one of these we can even recognize. Here you see already our T. We recognize here our T. This little thing is the ancestor of our O and also the ancestor of the Arabic Ain. There's a lot to be said about this, but here you have in the nucleus the earliest beginning. Well, let's fast forward very quickly because we don't have much time. We fast forward some 1,000, some 1,000, uh, over 2,000 years, and we come to this, which is one of the earliest inscriptions in the Arabic language from the year 300, uh, commemorating a king called Imrul Qais. And it's written in a script which is close to the uh, script of Nabataean. Uh, some of you have, will have been in, in Jordan, will have seen that. And uh, well, let's fast forward further and see what did the script, Arabic script look like at the time of the Prophet. Well, there is this particular document here, which is a letter supposedly sent by the Prophet. Is this letter genuine? What is certain is that it is a medieval document. It was dated, but whether the genuineness could not be assured. But you can see here a script which, whether it's genuine or not, is highly rudimentary and miles away from that beautiful manuscript which we saw at the beginning. But let's look at something more reliable, which is this one here. This is a remarkable document. It's a papyrus from the year 22 of the Hijra, or 642, and it's written in Greek and Arabic. It was, it was found in Egypt, and it's a receipt. It's the Arab armies conquering Egypt, got hungry in an Egyptian village, and they wanted something to eat. So the army got 65 sheep from the local village headman, and the uh, army commander gave the headman a receipt in two languages for these 65 sheep, so that the village headman could deduct it from the taxes. You can see from this rather interestingly that the Egyptian armies, that the Arab armies, were not simply pillaging, but already were engaging in some kind of administration. You already see here remarkably here the formula Bismillah Rahman Rahim, which already existed in this very, very early document. And it's definitely genuine because the Islamic dating and the Byzantine dating coincide. Uh, so this is a fascinating document. Um, the story continues, however, because from then on, the Arabic script faced a major challenge. In fact, two challenges. First of all, it became the script of empire. It had to represent power. And secondly, and that's an even bigger challenge, the Arabic script had to become commensurate with the divine revelation of the Quran. And here comes the biggest challenge that Arab scribes faced. What script is there that can be commensurate with a divine message, that can give visual representation to the words of God? Well, the challenge was there, and here is one answer. This is a script from the gov Umayyad governor of Egypt from the year 723. You see here a script which suddenly becomes stately and powerful. It wants to convey authority. Again, it's a demand for taxes this time. And here is the typical early Quranic script, the so-called Ma'il script, which was developed in, uh, in Maya times uh, to give expression to the Quran. And you can see already an attempt at regularity, at power of consistency, at a certain kind of rhythm. But it's still very far from what we have seen at the beginning. Well, then came a new phase. Then came the so-called Kufic script, which is this one here, which you know well, and which was the first really convincing answer that scribes had to the aesthetic challenge of how to give expression to the Quran in a visual medium that was beautiful and coherent and powerful. The technique here is really quite remarkable. What they've done is to take all the individual letters and combinations of letters and spread them all over the page with equal distances in between and uh, construct what has been called an architecture of the page whereby there is a proportional relationship between the height and the width of the page. But it has one thing, it is very difficult to read. If you don't know the text, it's really hard. For instance, here you have this word here is wal ard, wal ard, hugely spread out with all these distances. And here, is, here you have khalquhunna, because it's placed together 
it is all compressed. So there's a tremendous dis difference between compression on the one hand and expansion on the other. Looks tremendous, but really hard to read. Well, then came a revolution, and that revolution is called Al Khat Al Mansub, the proportion script. In the fourth century, we have something that then resulted in this. And that is the famous Quran of Ibn al Bawwab, which is the earliest Quran in this new script. And any one of you who know Arabic, and I think all of you here know, will recognize that this is actually the Arabic script we know today. So something happened. Something happened to generate the script that we know. The question is, what was it? It was the rise of the proportion script, Al Khat Al Mansub, which took place in the fourth century of the Hijra, uh, spearheaded by a man called Ibn Mukhla, and based upon what? Based upon geometry. We have here so called Handasat Al Huruf, the geometry of letters a system by which every single Arabic letter shape was put into a proportional relationship with every other. And I had the great privilege of working out or, this, or in investigating the rules of the Hanas al Hruf together with a great Egyptian calligrapher and painter and artist whom I would like to pay tribute here, Ahmed Mustafa. And we produced this book uh, to look into these rules. And what you see here is an illustration of the rules from a Mamluk manuscript, and the basis of everything is the length of the letter Aleph, which is here, and the letter Aleph, which is composed of seven dots. Out of the Aleph and its seven dots emerges everything else, and emerges also many different script styles, which are also have Alephs that are longer or shorter than seven dots. But this is the fundamental pattern. And so we started investigating this, uh, and we were wondering, you know, what is it based upon? Why geometry? And what we realized is that geometry was seen from a philosophical perspective as the language or the laws with which God put the universe together. There are laws of society on the one hand, and there are laws of nature on the other. And these laws of nature were perceived to be geometric. By generating a script based upon geometry, you generate a script based upon the laws of the cosmos. Hence, we um, have this conclusion, the proportion script can be understood as a writing system modeled upon the cosmic order in which geometry represents the concrete manifestation of divine justice. And for this reason, our book carries the title, The Cosmic Script. So we see here that science, in actual fact, is deeply rooted into a certain vision of the cosmos as an ordered entity, an ordered creation of the Lord, which must be reflected in the art of mankind. Then we proceeded to look into how these rules work, and I want to give a very, very brief uh, illustration. Uh, first of all, we have the seven dots in sequence, which make up the length and breadth of Aleph. And out of this, everything else comes. And if you superimpose the rules of the proportion script upon each other, you come to this ge geometric pattern, a pattern made up of a circle, a square, and a hexagon, out of which everything comes. And one very simple example, the letter Ba, is made up of a vertical stroke, one third of Aleph, and of a horizontal stroke, the length of Aleph. And out of this comes that, when it is drawn with the pen. So here's something extremely important. There is a difference between two things. The geometric skeleton of the letter, and what happens when the skeleton is, so to say, brought to life by the pen. And bringing it to life in Arabic, there's a term for it, tartib, moisturizing it, giving it the moisture of life. And the meaning of this can be illustrated with this image here. Here you have a snow crystal. Here you have geometry in nature, a hexagon, like we have it also in the script. When that crystal melts and becomes fluid, water becomes fluid. In the same way, when this pattern rigid geometric pattern, so to say, melts into fluidity through the action of the scribe, it gains this feature. And that this is not invented, but rooted in the theory at the time, you can see from the following quote, with which I will end, which comes from an 11th century manuscript about the proportion script, and it says the following. The soul is not content with the form of the letters without the correct execution of its proportions like the bodily members of a living being are proportioned, or like the paths of a plant are balanced. 
because the soul is enamored of beauty, and that is to be found in the proportionality of the natural world, whether seen or heard. So it is both the proportionality and the living beauty of the natural world that is reflected in the aesthetics of Arabic calligraphy at its greatest. And this is then the result. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we have it my again another great pleasure of mine. I have a lot of pleasure this evening introducing my colleague Saeed, who is actually the head of teaching Arabic in this great institution. So he has some poetry to read. And it is the, the, uh, one of our students, 14 students, uh, Sarah, who you will read. Thank you, Professor Halim. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, uh, I am grateful to Sarah to agree to read the translation with me. And I have to admit, uh, I am going to read four short pieces, only one of them is translated already by the famous translator, Lord Arbery of mm. Cambridge, was 19th century. Was he? No. no, he wasn't. Okay. I would love him to have become Lord. Okay. He uh, the rest, the other three pieces I translated myself, but Sarah did help me in mm. what we call in Arabic tanqih. She <laughs> kind of added some uh, flavor to the translation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, we say in Arabic, al diwan al Arab. Poetry is the record or the anthology or the register the book, the life of the Arabs. So we cannot celebrate Arabic language without some poetry. Uh, starting from the pre-Islamic period, I have selected a short piece by Antara. Mm -hmm. Antara, the legendary poet warrior of the tribe of Abs, whose poetry depicted the two most important themes in Arabic poetry, Al-Hub wal butula love and bravery. Here's a few lines he said to his beloved Abla after returning victorious from the battlefield, having single-handed rebelled the attacking tribe. Antara addressing Abla. يا دار عبلة بالجواء تكلمي وعني صباحا دار عبلة واسلمي كيف المزار وقد تربع أهلها بعنيزتين وأهلنا بالغيلم O oh, Abla's dwelling in Al-Jawa, do speak to me. May your morning be blessed and protected from harm. How may I visit you in your camp in Anezatein, a place far from our camp in Ghailam? Halla sa'alti al-qawma yabnata malikin, in kunti jahilatan bima lam ta'lami, yukhbirki man shahida al-waqi'ata annani, afsha al-wagha wa a'ifu inda al-maghnami, wa laqad zakartuki wa al-rimahu nawahilun minni, وبيض الهند تقطر من دمي فوددت تقبيل السيوف فوددت تقبيل السيوف لأنها لمعت كبارق ثغرك المتبسم O Malik's daughter If ignorant of things not known to you about me why not ask the horses of the combat zone and get answers to your questions. Those witnessing the event will tell you how I fearlessly run into battle and fight, and how I refrain from sharing in the spoils. I remembered you when the spears were dipping into my body and flashing swords dripping with my blood. At that very moment, how I desired to kiss the swords because they sparkled like your smiling mouth. Mm. With the coming of Islam, poetry began 
to spread its, uh, its functions and widen its rules. Some of the caliphs themselves were uh, connoisseurs of poetry and patrons of poets. The second caliph, Omar ibn al-Khattab, who was one of the most strict and fair rulers ever, he imprisoned a poet, a poor poet called al hutayya because al hutayya had a very sharp, vicious tongue. He attacked, his tongue attacked everybody. From his prison cell, al hutayya sent Omar uh, very few lines of poetry, uh, very emotional, imploring poetry, asking forgiveness. Apparently, Omar, when he heard those lines, apparently it's said that he cried and pardoned and forgiven al hutayya al hutayya imploring Omar. Something to notice, he actually addresses Omar by the first name Omar. He didn't say Amir al-Mu'mineen or anything, just Omar. ماذا تقول لأفراخ بذي مرخ زغ بالحواصل لا ماء ولا شجر غادرت كاسبهم في قعر مظلمة فاغفر عليك سلام الله يا عمر أنت الإمام الذي من بعد صاحبه ألقى إليك مقاليد النهى البشر لم يؤثروك بها لم يؤثروك بها إذ قدموك لها لكن لأنفسهم كانت بك الأثر فمن على صبية بالرمل مسكنهم فمن على صبية بالرمل مسكنهم بين الأباطح يغشاهم بها القدر نفسي فداؤك كم بيني وبينهم من عرض أودية يعمى لها الخبر أمار what do you say to young birds left alone at Zaymarach, unable to feed themselves, without water, without shade? You left their breadwinner in the depths of a deep, dark cell. Please forgive him, O Omar. God will bless you. You are the leader who was given the key position of power over all mankind. They have not favoured you when they gave you the leadership. They have actually favoured themselves. Please be kind to the young children who have no home but the sandy desert, where they're exposed to their miserable fate. I am far away from them, across a very wide valley. No one can see its other side. By the 9th and 10th century, Arabic poetry has reached its golden age with great poets. The greatest among them, without doubt, was al mutanabbi the man who was given the title Mali Dunya wa Shaghilun Nas. That translates as the one whose fame spread far and wide and made all people think of nobody but him. Those four words needed two lines in English. After his very busy life, busy composing great poetry, moving from Al Kufa to Baghdad to Aleppo to Antioch to Damascus to Tabarias, to Egypt. Late in his life, he found himself traveling far east into Persia, passing through a famous beauty spot in the valley of Bawan, which really fascinated and bewitched him. This resulted in a superb, amazing depiction of this natural beauty. But suddenly, in the middle of this depiction, he felt strange, he felt a stranger far from his roots and suddenly remembered Damascus. I am now emotional, I have remembered Damascus. He remembered Damascus with great affection and nostalgia. I'll start by reading some selected lines from the description of the natural beauty. I'll stop when he remembered Damascus. Al Mutanabbi in Sha'ab Bawan. Sha'ab could mean a road between mountains where he was traveling, and the natural beauty, and the birds, and the trees, and the flowers 
and the water, etc. Marani Sherbi Triban Fil Marani Bimanzilati Rabi Mina Zamani Walakin al Fatal Arabiya Fiha Garibul Wajhi Walli Di Walli Sani Mala Ibu Jinnatin Mala Ibu Jinnatin Lau Sara Fiha Sulaiman Lasara Biturjumani Fasirtu Wakad Hajabna Shamsani Wajitna Minodia Ibima Kafani وألقى الشرق منها في ثيابي دنانيرا تفر من البنان لها ثمر Let's try to imagine the fruits. لها ثمر تشير إليك منه بأشربة وقفن بلا أواني Was he drunk at that moment? The drink was in no cups. لها ثمر تشير إليك منها بأشربة وقفنا بلا أواني Let's hear the sound of the water وأمواه تصل بها حصاها صليل الحلي في أيدي الغواني The abodes of the valley in respect of delightfulness are in relation to all other abodes as spring among all other times but the Arab lad amidst them is a stranger in face, hand, and tongue. They are places of jinns to play in. If Solomon had journeyed to them, he would have journeyed with an interpreter. And I proceeded, the branches veiling the sun from me, and yet bringing me sufficient radiance. And the orient sun cast from them upon my garments, dinars that fled from my fingers. On the branches were fruits, pointing to you sweet vines, standing without vessels. And there were waters in which the pebbles chinked, like the chink of ornaments on the hands of young girls. Uh, some great poets in, in situations like that, suddenly they remember Damascus. The great Ahmad Shawqi in his Zahla tribute, after he said, Ya Zuhaylatu, he switched and said, Wa Dimashku Jannatun Naimi. Damascus is. Jannatun Naimi. Help Professor Halim. <laughs> Jannatun Naimi. At that moment, he switched and said, Walau kanat Dimashku. Walau kanat Dimashku thana inani, labiku thurdi sinu jifani. Tahillu bihi ala kalbin shuja'in, wa tarhalu minhu an kalbin jabani, manazilu. منازل لم يزل منها خيال يشيعني إلى النوب الذجاني where he was going وقد يتقارب الوصفان دمسكوس البوان وقد يتقارب الوصفان وقد يتقارب الوصفان جدا وموصوفاهما متباعدان he was on his horse of course يقول بشعب بوان حصاني عن هذا يسار إلى الطعام أبوكم آدم سن المعاصي أبوكم أبوكم آدم سن المعاصي وعلمكم مفارقة الجنان. And if they had been Damascus, my reins would have been turned back by a very skilled, generous, affluent man. You were like with him a heroic heart and depart from him out of a cowardly heart. Dwelling places, the phantom of which has not ceased to accompany me to Al-Nabandajan. The two descriptions being very close to each other, whilst the two described by them are remote from each other. My horse says at the valley of Bawan, must we leave this plate, place to go and fight? It is your father, Adam, who laid down for you disobedience and taught you to depart from paradise. Wow. Of course, I was told to stick to time, so I'm going mm. to jump from the 10th century to yes. the 20th century, yes. quickly, yes. quickly. Yes. From the 20th century, I have chosen a very short selection from a poem, a longish poem, written by Badawi al-Jabal, oh. on the occasion of the birth of his grandson. Mm. On, the, on the occasion of the birth of the grandson, he was praying to God, asking for peace. 
peace to spread all over the world only for the sake of the children. We really now need to pray for peace. Yes. A prayer for peace with Badawil Jabal. Waya Rabbi min ajli tufulati wahdaha. Waya Rabbi min ajli tufulati wahdaha. Afid barakati silmi sharkan wa marriba. ورد الأذى عن كل شعب ورد الأذى عن كل شعب وإن يكن كفورا وأحببه وإن كان مذنبا وصن ضحكة الأطفال وصن ضحكة الأطفال يا ربي إنها إذا غردت في موحش الرمل أعشب ويا ربي حبب كل طفل ويا ربي حبب كل طفل فلا يرى فلا يرى وإن لج في الإعنات وجها مقطبا وهيئ له في كل قلب صبابة وهيئ له في كل قلب صبابة وفي كل لقيا مرحبا ثم مرحبا Oh God, for the sake of the children alone May you make the blessing of peace flow east and west. And may you prevent harm from all people, even those who are ungrateful, and love even those who are sinful. Preserve the laughter of children, O Lord, for when the barren sand hears their singing, it will be full of green grass. And make every child be loved, O God, and not let him see any frowning face. No matter what he does, make him find affection in every heart, and welcoming faces everywhere he goes. When we, when we finished translating these five lines, Sarah said to me, it sounded like a real prayer. I said, yes, we want it to be a real prayer. Let's pray for peace. Sarah, I'm delighted that Sarah stepped in because we were saying we must have, uh, have some women amongst all these speakers. <laughs> and some students. And some students. Yes, and some students as well. Now, it is really my great pleasure to introduce our Venerable Professor of Professor Hugh Kennedy, who will speak to us about Arabic as a language of history of Islam. He's a historian himself, Arabic, and a historian. We could not have found anyone to talk about this better than him. Thank you very much, and it's been a real trip down memory lane this evening for me, in a sense that um, Arthur Arbery, whose translations um, you've just been hearing, I was his last pupil, I believe, and even more so and more relevant, it is now almost 50 years since uh, Professor Abdul Halim uh, started to try to teach me Arabic. I don't think I was a very good pupil because I'm still learning now and finding out things that I don't know and should have known and so on and so so forth. But what have I done with this education that was uh, uh, that I was given by such eminent scholars? And I've used it really throughout my career as a way of reading the great tradition of Arabic history writing, the great tradition of Arabic historiography in the classical period, in the pre-modern period, which I think is one of the great historical traditions in the uh, in the whole world, and it contains such a wealth of wonderful details, such a wealth of wonderful observation and so on. In a way, all human life is there, and it's a source of endless fascination to me. It's also an enormous and vast tradition. I'm going to talk about two historians very, very briefly. The first is Abu Jafar Tabari, an old, old friend of mine, whose work I constantly refer to, uh, return to and find new things in. And the second, Abu Ali Muscaway. Tabari died in 923 of the Common Era, was an immensely industrious man. He wrote a history of the Islamic world, which dates from, roughly it starts with the beginning of the world and goes through to his own time. And this has now been translated into English, and it comes out, the English version, in 38 printed volumes. Each of these volumes is more than 250 pages long. And that was only half of what he wrote. 
for he went on, or he did at the same time, or before, I can't remember, uh, the, uh, he wrote a tafsir of the Quran, which is almost as long as his tariq. What an immensely industrious man he was. And you might think that the whole of this history would become sort of rather tedious. Uh, what the uh, that sort of history that the uh, famous Duke of Wellington called one damn thing after another, just a procession of endless, uh, boring and melancholy events. Not so, because Tabari uses the immense resources that were at his disposal, the resources of literature. He must have had access to his Baghdad at the time when it's the thriving heart of uh, it's a thriving metropolis of culture and civilization. He must have had access to an enormous library of books. We know a bit about how, how he found these books and so on. And he takes stories and he chooses stories that illustrate uh, the points he wants to make. And people talk a lot about whether this history is reliable or not. There's been a trend in Western scholarship, which a part of which actually began here in Zaha some years ago, to be very critical, very... Um, of this historiography, we can't believe it. It's all a sort of, sorry, I, I'm being told I'm not hearing. It's all a sort of, uh, a, um, uh, it's all made up, so to speak, to make particular religious points and so on. But when you actually read uh, Tabaré's history, as well as his concern for detail and chronology, as all good historians should have, there's a wonderful concern for the human experience for people who behave well, people who behave badly. A section that I like to read with my students every year, one or two of them I'm seeing here, in fact, about just the death of the Caliph al-Amin. Now, this is a tiny fragment of, uh, in the year 813, when he was murdered by the uh, troops uh, of his, uh, supporting his brother al-Mamun. And the, it's only a tiny proportion of Tabari's great history, a sort of a thousandth, perhaps, of it. But the way that when we read this carefully together, we can see the way in which he uses it as a whole discussion of the human predicament, the way the young Caliph Al-Amin, who has been portrayed in the early days as the rather ignorant, boastful uh, uh, contrast to his brother al Mamun and his father Harun al-Rashid, becomes in the uh, story of his death something of a martyr, something of a... A, a real live human being, and I compare this when I'm dealing, uh, when I'm introducing students to this, to the whole discussion in Shakespeare's play of Richard II about again a profligate, arrogant young man who, in his death days, becomes a hero, even a martyr. And I'm very interested in the way in which uh, Tabari and Shakespeare both come together and. Uh, develop these themes of human experience. And it's this whole richness, this whole humanity of the tradition, which I think is so inspiring and interesting. My second uh, historian, Abu Ali Miskaway, is a less well-known figure, I think. He's writing about uh, 150 years after Tabari. He chronicles the disintegration of the Abbasid Caliphate with meticulous detail, relying on eyewitness accounts and people whose works he'd, he'd, he'd read. The story of human folly, the story of um, how people make one bad decision after another and the violence and unhappiness that results from this. But he does this not in the sense, I think, of condemning the participants, not in the sense of making judgments about how foolish and stupid people are, and so on. But he does it as part of a, a real philosophical inquiry. How should politicians behave well? What makes for good government? What do good people do when they have to make decisions that affect the, uh, uh, the, the future of, of nations and peoples and so on? For the other book that um, Miskaway is famous for, he wrote quite a lot of stuff, but apart from his history, is a book of, about uh, akhlaq, about morals. It's a philosophical treatise about what the good life should be. Now, Miskaway was without doubt a uh, pious and God-fearing Muslim, but it's not a book about religious ethics. It's a book that stresses what we might call humanistic ethics. It stresses moderation in all things. 
avoidance of unnecessary cruelty, thinking what you're going to do in advance, taking into account other people's motives and so on. And he uses the rich and, and really rather terrifying and shocking in many ways uh, story of the historical events to make these ethical points. Not often he doesn't stress it, he doesn't bang on about it, so to speak, and bring it up front. But his stories, the way he chooses the stories of people's lives, illustrate exactly the points about what should good men do in power, what is good government, what is bad government, what leads you to disaster, what leads you to success, how can you benefit your, your uh, fellow men. So for all these reasons, I find reasons that go way beyond actually establishing what dates things happened and who was where and so on. I think that both these great historians are in a way great minds who make a profound and very interesting contribution to our investigation of the human condition, the investigation of all our human conditions. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Right at the end. It's all joy and all pleasure. Thank you very much. You know, I am very pleased. I'm fully satisfied with this. I was wondering at the beginning how it would work, but we had these excellent speakers. We have a lovely audience here. And